This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Gavin Henry, and today my guest is Daniel Stenberg. Daniel is the founder and lead developer of Curl and LibCurl, an internet protocol geek, an open source person, and a developer. He has worked on HTTP implementations for over 25 years, has been active in the IETF for over a decade, and worked on the HTTP stack in Firefox for several years at Mozilla. He currently works at Wolf SSL. Robert, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Is there anything I missed in your bio that you'd like to add? Thank you, and good to be here. No, I think that sort of covers the basics. But possibly I could add that I've done a lot of other open source stuff as well, but sort of curl is my baby. That's my primary focus. Excellent. And this show is going to be quite different for me and for the podcast in general. We're going to be talking about the curl project, history, war stories, loads of different things. So it's going to be really exciting. We're going to have a chat about five or six topics related to the curl project for around 10 minutes each. So let's start. Daniel, please take us through the 25-year journey, if 25 years is correct. You can bring me up on that, of Carl in 10 minutes or so, or do your best. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, 25 years it is if we count the projects I did before I renamed it Curl. So basically, my journey with Curl started Sort of in the mid '90s, I worked on another open source project with a friend. Which was it was an IRC bot. We called it the Dancer at the time. It doesn't really matter. But in 1996 or so, in the autumn, there I figured out that I wanted to provide a currency translation or exchange service for the bot for IRC users. So I started to look around on how to do that, and I realized that of course, if you want to do a currency exchange, we need the currency rates sort of reasonably updated every now and then. So I needed a little tool to download currency rates using HTTP because I found sites that hosted currency rates on HTTP. So I looked around and I found a little tool called HTTP GET that would do the job for me. And so I started working with that tool to do my currency exchange thing. And then I pretty immediately found some issues with that tool. So I corrected those and I sent the patches back to the author who accepted it and then released follow-up releases for that tool, HTTP GET. And that first HTTP GET version that I found and used was released in November 1996. And I think Raphael, the author of that tool, he got bored with me pretty quickly because I kept sending him patches for doing more things. So I became the maintainer of that tool pretty within weeks, actually, I think. I don't remember exactly the timing there, but I was the maintainer of that tool within a few releases. So I think I did my first release of that tool in the end of 1996. So that is 25 years, a little bit more than that. So I worked on that tool, HTTP GET, for a while until I realized I wanted to extend my currency exchange service with more rates. And I found another site that hosted currency rates on Gopher. So yay, I need more currency rates. So I just need to make my tool support Gopher as well so that I could download Gopher too, HTTP and Gopher. So I added Gopher support to HTTP GET, and then HTTP GET became a pretty bad name because it didn't only do HTTP. So it did HTTP and Gopher. So I changed the name to URL get instead because it would get URLs. And then by that time, the tool would also work on URLs. That was one of the early changes I participated to make in the tool. And then we kept it as URL get for a while. We, we released version 2 and version 3 and called it URL get during 1997. And then, and I also found I don't remember exactly why. I think I found another site as well that provided currency rates over FTP. So I added FTP support. So now it could download data from FTP, Gopher, and FTP. And in the early 1998, I started to add support for FTP uploads as well. And then again, I realized that, wow, calling it URL get 
it doesn't reflect the nature of the tools is now it doesn't only do gets anymore it would do puts or uploads as well so eh, I, I wanted to rename it again so i renamed it to curl and we released the first curl version in in march 1998 and i kept the version numbering from the previous tools so URL get version 3 became curl version 4.0 there in, in March 1998. So then it could download from three protocols, upload to one protocol. And is the C in curl for C programming language? No, I, I actually I wanted to have a name and I thought it would be fun with a name that has URL in it because it works on URLs. So I, I and then I figured I wanted short, maybe a pronounceable name, you know, Unix style. So maybe C could be for client. I figured client for URLs, and C could also work as a sort of if you pronounce it C the URL as a sort of more of a pun like thing. So I figured why not? And I just want the primary goal was there to have a short, short word so that you could type it easily on in command lines. So I went with curl. I didn't really spend a lot of time with the name. It was just, yeah, let's go with curl. And it stuck, and I think it's a pretty good name. So at that time then, in 1998, by that time it started, in 1996, it was slightly less than 300 lines of code in the first tool. I don't have the entire early history preserved, so I'm sort of restored some of it. But the time I did the first curl release, it was about... 2400 lines of code and i think it had 25 command line options or so and that was only a command line tool then and we started working on that or i kept on working on that and then uh, we got people trying it out submitting patches and you know extending it more and more and the first major change from that point was in the summer 2000 summer here in in my parts of the world i re modeled the internals a little bit and provided a library. So libcurl was born in, in, in 2000 so that we could provide, well, an API and internet transfer capabilities basically to others, other applications or programming languages and so on. Because I thought about it from the beginning and I thought it would be cool. And at that time, I sort of made it happen. And when I did one of the first that immediately adopted libcurl as a library was the PHP language, which I think was fortunate for us because they really had a lot of users. They still have a lot of users, so they really tested it. They really got to submit a lot of bugs, and they had ideas how to do it. And so we, we got it tested, and it took off really quickly from that point. Well, not like a rocket, but it sort of gradually increased popularity, and people started to use it. and from that point, we just kept on fixing bugs, adding things. We added more protocol support over time. We added TLS support already before we had the library. So it's, it supported HPS already back in, I believe, 1999. And from that point on, we've just kept on adding support for things, features, and a lot of different backends. We are pretty soon decided to support multiple implementations for different protocols so for example we started with tls support with the old ss i don't even know how they pronounce it you know the precursor to open ssl ss lee or whatever they pronounce it and then we switched to open ssl but pretty soon we also started to support other tls libraries like gnu tls and nss and a few of the others and over time we've always worked on supporting a lot of different tls libraries and over time then we also have added support for multiple different libraries for other things like SSH or IDN and name resolving and stuff like that. So we had that sort of infrastructure idea from early on to pretty much allow the user who's, who's building curl to decide what kind of third-party libraries they want to use when they build curl. Thanks. Yeah, I've seen the options when you go to install libcurl or curl, it gives you different versions of TLS libraries, you know, if you're installing through a Debian package manager or Ubuntu or something. Excellent. That's a, a good part of the history. Best you can do in 10 minutes. Were you quite an accomplished C programmer before you started in 96, just before I finish off this section, move us on? Yes, I had been working 
I mean, I, I'm a software developer since, of, of course, since before that. So I had been working professionally with C programming for several years before that. So I was pretty comfortable with writing programs in C, yes. Excellent. So now we've had that good history lesson. Can you think of a couple of things for the next 10 minutes that you learned over that time that surprised you or might surprise others in those 25 years? I'm not sure I have learned much sort of big surprises. Uh, <laughs> I think I've, I've learned all those things that most people would learn doing something like this for a long time. For example, just learning how to write something that is actually maintainable over time. For example, clear code, comments in the code, explaining things to my future self and stuff like that. And the value of doing test cases and documenting things and just having sensible hygiene in the project. Nothing of that is surprising or, or strange in any way, but it's when you work in something for a long time, I think more of those things actually become important because you get to sort of discover things about your own code and thinking down the road because you have to when you live with it for such a long time. Maybe what about a protocol that you implemented that took much longer than you ever expected and that surprised you? Oh, yeah. But, but I think in general, I mean, HTTP is my primary protocol. I think that's the protocol curl is most known for, most used for, and the one I spent most time on. And I think HTTP is one of those protocols that, yeah, it seems so simple. I remember when I started working on HTTP, that was so simple to implement. You know, just text and you just type get and, and it'll get that. And over time, you, you really realize that HTTP is, yes, it seems so easy on the outside and, and sort of on the surface when you see that text. And, and of course, over the years and recent 10 years, we've switched away from the text-based as well. But it was never an easy protocol and it's, get, it's getting more and more complicated over, over time. So implementing something HTTP today, it's really, really complicated, in, spe in particular if you want to support multiple versions. So yeah, I think basically all protocols that are well used have turned out to be much more complicated in the real life and in real world than I for sure sort of foresee from the beginning. And I mean, none of them are ever done, right? Because um, we keep getting bug reports uh, today on stuff we wrote and implemented decades ago so things are never done it's doing things internet protocols networking across the internet is challenging and have you been surprised on protocols that have come and gone or libraries that you use or things you've implemented that have outlasted how long you think you'd need to support them or you've had to drop stuff over that time my primary view of things is that i i don't really foresee i don't make any projections or or try to tell how the world will look in the future. I'm looking at where we are right now, and I'm trying to adapt to that, and maybe where we're going this year or this few months ahead. So I'd, I never try to actually tell what we will do in the next two, five, ten years, that, because I find it impossible to do that. But sure, in general, things t stick around much longer than you ever think when it shows up. So of course, for example, introducing new protocol versions, something you, we know that the old protocol versions, they will stick around for a very, very long time, even when something new, better, shinier comes along. And in curl, we have this concept that we don't modify, we don't break ABIs or APIs, so we stick around, we support everything we provided in the past as well. So I'm not sure I'm surprised. That is more of how the world works. And of course, it's really hard to say, especially when you use a lot of third-party libraries, it's hard to say, sure, we can have support for a new third-party library today, but we can't tell how that third-party library will be maintained, survive, or act tomorrow, right? Or in two years, or five years, or 12 years, who knows where they are going. So over the years, of course, we realized that some, for example, TLS libraries that we added support for in the past, they mostly maybe died over the years, and then we eventually rip out support for that particular library or subsystem or stuff like that. And the infamous question that I'm sure people always ask is, are you happy of the choice of the C programming languages, a language for curl and libcurl? 
In general, I would say that I'm very happy. And that is based on several things, really. Because first of all, we started, as I mentioned before, we started this in the 90s. And in the 90s, making a portable library or portable tool, portable anything, there was no real choice other than C to go with. I mean, C++ could possibly have been a choice, but not even C++ had a stable ABI back in the day. So you couldn't really do any portable libraries back then with C++. And I've never been a C++ fan, so I'm <laughs> I, I avoid C++. So yes, I'm happy with C. And C has then made it possible to really, really make curl and libcurl the portable available everywhere library that it is. It is C that is the explanation why it is used and can be used in so many, many different places, operating systems, CPU architectures, and everything. And I would say it isn't until very recent years that there actually have started to appear viable alternatives that could have been used, but they can be used now. They could not be used 20 years ago. One of the benefits and one of the things with Curl is that we have the age, we have the maturity, we have been around for so long. So it has had the time to mature and, and you know, stabilize and everything. And that's a very big thing too. Yeah, it's not something you just want to start again and a new language that's come up. No, exactly. Because whatever you do, it takes a really long time to become a really stable and solid thing to do like this. And I, I, I think that's one of the primary benefits you have when you go with Curl, that you get all this battle-proven time and have been shaped by nature for so long. And it's, that's hard to replicate. Or I mean, you can replicate it. It'll just take a long time. Well, that brings us nicely on to my next section, which I've called key events in the timeline. So I really like the history and timeline document that you have on GitHub and that I saw on the mail list. It's very complete. Could you pick two or three of your favorite things from the timeline filed you shared? I think it was December or last month. Or maybe talk about things you wish you could delete on that list. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so much. Well, I've got a couple in my list and you can agree or disagree. So I'm thinking when Carol was on Mars, when Apple included it in macOS, your favorite protocols, when the user base reached a certain amount, the number of bugs, when you got your first CVE security thing, any of those. Yeah, those are good events. So, of course, in the beginning, when Carl started, of course, you know, as anything that is started as a small project, when people like it, start to use it and adopt it in different surroundings, that those are key events and those were really fun too. Mark. So, of course, when Apple included it in, in Mac OS in 2001, in September 2001, that was really a key event for me because it's so, that was one of the first non-Linux operating systems that actually adopted Curl as a standard tool in their operating system. So, that marked something sort of a notch and a sign of success. So, I have that marked and I thought that was a really great moment in time. And, of course, as, as you mentioned, it was confirmed to be used in the Mars helicopter mission in 2021. And that was a really fun moment, of course, a really excellent ego boost. And one of the things we've talked back and forth in the Curl project for, for a long time is to get any kind of confirmation that Curl has been used in space. Because we've had that. People have mentioned it in the past that it might have been used on the ISS and stuff like that. But I've never had it confirmed from anyone or had any proof. And then finally, when we got the proof that they actually used it on in the Mars mission, that was such a cool moment to say that, yes, finally, one more planet than just Earth. So was that in something that was doing requests within an operating system on Mars or coming back to the base? They won't tell. So it's, it's really impossible to say. I have no idea. They've just said that they've used it in the helicopter mission. I wonder what the latency is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine it can't really be done from Mars to Earth using Curl. I would imagine it must be something shorter distance, but I really couldn't tell. And they won't tell, so we can just speculate on whatever it is. For me, of course, one key moment in time is when I got the Paul Hem Award Prize in Sweden in 2017. So I actually got a gold medal from a, which is an engineering award here in Sweden. It's a an, an really old one. It's over 100 years old, sort of handed out to 
engineers in Sweden who have sort of accomplished something, blah, blah. But it was a good moment in time for me. And I got that award handed over to me by the Swedish king at a great gala dinner here in Stockholm. That was awesome. Wow, congratulations. And the user base figures or bugs or security issues, or was there a point on that timeline where you thought, what have I created? <laughs> you know? There have been some times, you know, when people have said something that have made me realize that, wow, the number of users is a really high number now. I remember counting at some point in time when I, I realized it might be several hundred million installations now. That's crazy. And nowadays we count somewhere maybe more than 10 billion installations. So you get a little to the numbers because they're so immensely big now. So it's, <laughs> it's hard to even imagine. But of course, I remember stuff like when, when I realized that it was used in, in, for example, wow, it's installed in most Android installations. And I re- when I also realized that it's used by default in iOS, then I also realized that, wow, it's used in quite a lot of places. And I have these fun email interactions when I got that email from a, from a woman. I think this was in 2016 or so. I got an email from a woman who... Well, she was confused, but she wanted my help to fix her Instagram account because apparently I know the Instagram people because she found my name in Instagram. And that was one of the moments when I realized, wow, they're using my code in in, in the Instagram app on iOS as well. (laughs) Those particular moments could be a little bit of eye-opening that it is used in in a lot of those big volume apps. Yeah, it's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it, when you just think about everything in that document. So yeah, I noticed that you keep track of the security releases as well. Are they different things, or is that programming patterns that keep appearing, or how do you classify those types of things? I try to keep very close track of exactly all the security problems that we have had reported on Curl. And we have this bug bounty where we reward security researchers who are who file or submit issues that are confirmed to be security problems. And then I I try to make it a really good effort. I pride myself to actually go into the details and then research exactly when we insert the problem, when we fix it, and try to figure out exactly how it happened and how you can exploit it and everything that, and try to document all of that. And part of the reason for doing that, except for then later being able to do fun graphs and when bugs were inserted or fixed, is that it's also a good way to you know try to learn something from the problem. It was inserted at this point. This is the mistake. We fixed it like this, but what could we have done or what should we do now so that we don't do the same kind of, the, or even exactly the same mistake once more? That's really hard because it's like a normal bug, right? When you, once you read it and once you have that report, you can, oh, you realize that, yes, that's a silly mistake. Why did we ever do it like that? Of course, it's stupid. But it wasn't stupid, or at least we didn't realize the stupidity at the time when we inserted it. So what do you learn from that? So it's typically very hard to actually not view it as a one-off mistake. And sort of everyone makes mistakes. We can't fix that. But then we also try, I have tried to do certain things in the code, like avoiding certain styles of programming patterns. For example, one of the things I realized actually that we had several security problems that were the result of silly integer overflows and um, realocs or malocs based on that potential uh, integer overflow. And I've actually done two things in the project to reduce the likeliness of that ever happening again. Is that one of the things is that we now nowadays have a pretty much universal limit on string length, so string data inputs you can send to libcurl, which limits string size to it. I think it's eight megabytes, which is a ridiculously high limit, but it avoids the chance that someone can put in a string that is next to two gigabytes on a 32-bit architecture, for example or stuff like that. And we also have uh, introduced a new sort of internal API and buffer system to try to make as reduce the number of realogs done within the C code because it, I realized that we had several of those security problems in close association to realogs or, and realogs to growing 
buffers, growing memory buffers. So I'm trying to avoid stuff like that. So hopefully avoid some of the mistakes we've done in the past. Other things we're doing that we are recently or we started late 2020. So and I worked with the ISRG who has sponsored a project to support replacing the built-in HTTP back and the HTTP coding curl. Well, not all of it, but part of it with a HTTP library written in Rust called Hyper. That's, of course, another way to potentially address or avoid future mistakes, at least C mistakes, by making sure that we use less C and more other languages than C. That's a good point to move on to the next section. So war stories, I'm calling this. I'd like you to now talk about some of the hard bugs you squashed or other memorable stories during the project's life, if that's okay. What stands out for you and makes you think, if I did that, I can do anything? Or we could drill into some of those security issues a bit more, because I like the sound of what you just explained, what you're doing with the HTTP library layer. So yeah, if I did that, I can do anything. Is there anything that comes up? Not really, or rather, uh, (laughs) there's so much of that, I think. Bugging-wise, I think doing things, there are so many layers of code. I think in curl itself, there's a lot of layers and the people, applications, and there are languages. And I think in, in general, we have things like languages doing bindings, doing libcurl, who's doing things. So, And then someone writes an application in that language using the binding, using libcurl, who's doing TLS, doing a protocol where something is wrong when you're using a third-party library. So I figure sometimes it's really, really difficult to understand or f- yeah, yeah, just figure out where the problem might be or there's so many layers, so many different responsibilities, so many different angles it could be. So I think sometimes we really dig around for a very long time in a lot of code to figure out where it is. So I think <laughs> it's common pattern. One of my favorite ones, I think, I have a quote somewhere when Facebook reported a problem with curl, Facebook I think they still use, they have a PHP version. A lot of Facebook is written in, so they use libcurl from PHP. And well, they they experienced some kind of lag that took, I don't remember exactly, I think it was some delay with some milliseconds in some kind of request. And I got, I have, I saved the response quote because the person I I worked with or communicated with, he, he then sent me an email and said, I tested your patch in production and it works. And I figured that was fun just because testing my patch in production on Facebook, that seemed like, well, it was a few years ago, but that was still hundreds of, hundreds of millions of users. And that was fun. Another fun little bug I remember that, that sort of stands out among other bug fixes is that I was contacted by a company in Germany who was doing software for some car company. And the person who contacted me said that we have 8 million cars waiting for a firmware upgrade here, but we can't deliver that because curl is crashing. Oh, dear. (laughs) (laughs) And that that was back in the day when I didn't even work on curl. So I was just, you but okay, thank you for telling me that. But, you know, curl is a spare time project here. So I don't know what you expect me to do here. Because his next then follow-up question was, can you fly down here tomorrow and help us fix this? <laughs> I tried to explain to him, no, I, you know, I have this full-time work and I, you know, I'm expected to deliver something this week and I can't just take off in the middle of the week to go to Germany to fix your thing. <laughs> I managed to find a friend who could fly down there and I could help them from remote. So we fixed it within a day or two. So that was fun. But yeah, there's been a few of those adventurous bug fixes over the years yeah what was the one the other day i saw on the mail list on twitter i think it was to do with the log 4j exploit wasn't it that's his biggest story so since curl for <laughs> i don't know exactly why but we modified the mit license slightly when we adopted the mit license back in 2001 i think we switched curl to mit license so it's slightly modified from the mit language it's just a few words that are not the same it's basically MIT. But anyway, 
And in that license file, it says copyright, blah, 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 Daniel Stenberg, blah, 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 and my email address. And that particular license file is usually included in different operating systems or, or products or devices and uh, about screens on a lot of places. Partly because it's not an I- MIT straight off, so it's usually recognized as the curl license and not a regular. So when people bundle a lot of licenses, it still stands out because it's not among the regular MIT ones. It's separate. It's a curl one. And it's also usually then ends up as one of the few licenses that actually has a personal email address in them. So when people ship products or devices and stuff, and they put together a bunch of licenses, you know, hundreds of licenses is um, that uncommon. People eventually, or some people eventually find my name and email in there, and they email me about it, about whatever problem they have that is associated that sort of they have with their device or tool or car or printer or anything. Computer games is pretty common too. So people have problems with things. They look around and usually I guess they are actually pretty upset with something and they are frantically searching for someone to contact. I guess in many cases, they already try to contact 22 different people and then finally they find my email somewhere in there. And then I'm going to email this guy and he's going to help me with my issue, whatever the issue is. So I get a lot of fun emails from people who want help with issues with their software where I usually don't even know what they're talking about. And uh, recently I got an email from a big company. They're actually called, I didn't say that in the blog post, but they're actually MetLife. MetLife is a really big insurance company and they're, I think they're on Fortune 100. And they emailed me a lot of questions about how to make sure that their products aren't vulnerable for the log4j vulnerability and they called me a partner in the email i guess they found my uh, my address in some kind like that scanning a lot of licenses in their products or something and of course for me it just turned out really confusing because i don't do any java anywhere and i've never participated in any java products anywhere so of course nothing that i ever wrote has any log4j in it so the question was mostly confused but then as i said i've kind of used to getting those kind of questions because and i think almost the same day i got that log 4j question i got another question from someone who he was upset about the player choices he got when playing some soccer game i don't even remember the name of it but that guy asked me to help him get better players and then he sent me also a screenshot that showed my name in the in the license window of that computer game you have to drill pretty deep to get to the about page in most apps yes <laughs> i don't know how they found you know that's strange there's some user interface failure if they're having to go to the about page and drill into licenses to find a contact not only user interface failure i think there's also you know a general feedback customer relation problem because i also had a lot of car problems mailed to me and finding my name in a car infotainment system that is also you know it takes a lot of will (laughs) patience to find it so it says something about how hard it is for regular people to actually get in contact with someone who who, who did the, the, the software for their devices just before we move on to the next section it sounded really interesting what you mentioned about bringing rust in as a library Will that mean that you've then got another library to maintain that's part of the library? Or how will that work? Pretty much, yes. Basically, already when you build curl today, or libcurl also, we use third-party libraries for certain things that we don't do ourselves, like handling TLS, SSH, different compressions, and stuff like that. So we're already leaning on other libraries for doing part of the functionality. So when you build libcurl and ship it with your thing, you already use libcurl and a number of other libraries. So when now we're enabling or making it possible to build libcurl to use different Rust libraries, you're only maybe adding libraries or replacing libraries. So you go with the Rust ones instead of other ones. But yes, you're certainly going to 
add dependency and rely on other libraries as well as on top of libcurl then. So that means the core HTTP functionality will be moved away from C and into Rust and as a separate library that way? Yes, but I'm doing it the same way as I do with all the different TLS libraries, but pretty much so I, I still have a native implementation in C that you can replace at build time. So you can go, you go either with a C solution, the native one, or you go with the one in Hyper, the Rust one. So at build time, you select which one to go. Because I'm a firm believer that I need to keep and maintain the C version because as I sort of talked about uh, half an hour ago, the C version is what makes curl as portable and as popular in, in so many places. So I think the C version is going to still stick around and be available and be used by, I'm not sure if most people, but by a lot of people going forward as well. And we'll see how the Rust solutions go. I mean, if they will become popular and used and so on. I have really no way of telling or no idea how they will fare going forward. Hopefully they will be popular and used, but I really can't tell if they will be. Yeah, going over the timeline of what the history of Carl, you know, it's a, it's a long time. So you'll just have to see, I suppose. Just to close off this section... You mentioned the Rust bit to help potentially with some security issues. Do a lot of the security issues, are they particular to programming patterns in C or nothing to do with C or a combination or something in how the protocol is implemented that's been missed? I try to count the number of obvious mistakes that are due to the programming language C. And I think it's about half. I think we're going slightly below half now. But somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of the problems have been C mistakes. So if we would imagine that the entire curl would have been written in a memory-safe language, maybe we could have avoided 50% of them. But that said, we also do things differently now. So I'm not convinced that we're going to see 50% of them being C mistakes in the future. But it's hard to say. Excellent. Thank you. So the next section... I'd like to talk about release cycles and feature request process. Can you tell us about your release cycle and feature request process? For example, how do we request features? How do you assess their suitability? And what made me think of this is the other day you tweeted about release and the sense of relief that comes out of that. And then an hour later, a bug report comes in. And you're like, <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the regular release cycle. Yes. So I've always been a been a believer of the of the old traditional open source mantra to release early and release often. And nowadays people do that even more since a lot of software these days are are server based or cloud based. So, but anyway, I've always tried to do a lot of releases so that people can get the opportunity to have the latest code often so if we fix anything they don't have to wait around for a long time until they get the next release so pretty much we started out early on to do very frequent releases and after a while maybe a decade i don't remember exactly when we switched to it i think it was like 15 years ago or maybe something like that we switched to a completely time-based release cycle so we pretty much just set the clock and we stick to that cycle so we we do releases every eight weeks if nothing else happens. So we stick to that and we have the first half of that release cycle open for merging features and doing changes, as we call them, things that are actually potentially adding features or changing things. And then the second half of that release cycle, we don't accept new changes or features. We just fix bugs. Then we do a release and then we start over, pretty much. I think it has turned out to be pretty successful because it limits the speed in which we allow features. And it also it makes us have a pretty long time where we only work on bug fixes, which has turned out to be, I think, pretty good because it makes people work a lot on bug fixes. And I think bug fixes are, are the most important things we can do. And we stick to this. Whenever we find something really critical, buggy, within the release cycle, we can make an exception and make another release without eight weeks having, having sort of 
been using that as a cycle and we do that every now and then when we find some terrible bugs that we insert it but the ideal case is eight weeks then release and usually we don't even do emergency releases for security fixes either because they're rarely that critical so we usually bundle the security fixes too and include them in the release at that particular release point in time and having eight weeks like on the clock, it makes it also very easy to plan everything because we know ahead of time exactly the dates of all the future releases as long as we just keep the release cycle. We know when we go to the feature freeze, we know when the release is going to happen and so on. So it's, it's also an easy scheduling thing for me, I think. And for the relief, I think it's when we work on something for eight weeks and we sell, we package everything and we put it together and, and upload it to the site and we can blank out the change log and say, wow, we start out on a blank sheet. Now everything is released. Everything is fine. This feels great. That's an awesome feeling to just, you know, ship it. And ah, that's it. That I so enjoy that moment when, when everything feels fresh and new and, and everyone can upgrade to the latest and greatest. That moment is awesome. And as, as you said, pretty much until someone reports a bug in the new version as well, or a new one or something bad. Or Anyway, it's still a great feeling. And when we have re- done a new release, we, d- we always do releases on Wednesdays. So we do releases on Wednesdays and then another one eight weeks later. So when we have done a release on a Wednesday, we wait until the following Monday to open the feature window again, but pretty much to give it a few days for anyone to report alarming bugs because if there's an alarming bug we don't open the feature window and we work on an emergency fix instead and maybe we do another release the next week or so but if we open the feature window again after that release we pretty much allow features to get merged and then it of course becomes the question follows the question where what features do we merge when we have the feature open and it's a bit of a um, random thing. It's pretty much what people are providing in pull requests and that are in good shape, mature, and we agree that it's good change. And combined with someone who's actually also able to review it and accept it and you know work with the author to make sure that it gets up to snuff and being good enough to merge. I usually myself have a few things that I sort of keep working on that I want to have merged myself. So I try to make sure that I have pull requests ready or in time because I, of course, also sort of submit to the same rules. I'm only merging changes during this. When the feature window is open, that's the only time I can merge features as well. So I, and of course, I have a slightly easier chance to get my stuff merged because i know better than most exactly how to do it and how to to do everything correctly and and have it accepted by everyone but otherwise it's it's a discussion i usually allow anyone to provide whatever and as long as you can motivate it and discuss or argue for your sake and for your features we discuss it and we work with it and we make sure that we we have some kind of rough consensus and then go forward with that is it usually a case where it's a pull request through GitHub and they've done the feature and they just want to see it be part of the library or the curl project or do they request that you guys could put it into your schedule to do it? I think we have we have everything from the from both ways or sort of and everything there in between. I mean, some sometimes someone, you know, shows up with a huge pull request and says, I've already done this, we've used it for two years, here's the pull request. And sometimes it's just people, you know, nagging and say, why don't you ever do this feature? We really need it or something like that. And we have everything there and in between. Of course, the best thing is when someone is actually working with us. The best thing is when people don't come there and submit a really big one. The first thing we hear about it is when they submit a few thousand lines of, of diffs. Because maybe they did it in a way we don't quite agree with. Maybe they did it in a way we could have done better to take advantage of whatever. So it's, it's better to get that communication started early and see if we want to do this, what's the best way to do it? And then work with, with the team to get it done. But I also get a lot of 
good ideas from people who, you know, anyone who's randomly using curl and says, why? Oh, I thought of a good idea. Maybe it should do this. And of course, good ideas need to be provided first before, before we can do anything like that, right? So a good idea is a good idea. Even if sometimes good ideas is also, you know, it's a little bit too easy to just submit a good idea because an idea is easy also, but maybe they re- actually implementing the idea is not always as easy. And in addition to that, I work on Curl full-time. I work for Wolf SSL. And this works because I sell Curl support. So someone is paying me to help them with use Curl or help them do curl correctly in their applications and devices. And part of that, they can also pay me to help them get features done in curl that they want. And of course, that has to be featured that I accept and want into the project as well. So sometimes people are actually paying or I do work as part of my paid contracts to land features as well. And have you ever had to say, no, that doesn't work? We don't want your money? or? Yes, but it usually doesn't really work. Like it, it's rarely, you know, they say something A and I say, I blankly say no. If they say I want this and I, I think it's a bad match for curl, maybe we don't have to do exactly like you asked. Maybe we could do this part in curl and you should do that part in your application and we could work it through. So it's rarely a yes and no situation is more of a gray area where we can discuss exactly what should curl do, what should your application do, what shouldn't. So it's it's more of a matter of discussing and debating oftentimes when I talk to people who actually pay for this. And, and it goes with whoever submits a pull request too, right? Sometimes people submit a lot of things that maybe you're asking curl or libcurl to do a little bit too much. Maybe you should, you know, take away a little bit and do that yourself outside of curl instead or maybe this is completely out of the out that curl shouldn't do but having worked with the project for so long we have to make a really big effort to limit the number of features and limit the growth or just you know scaling everywhere we can't do that because we have to make sure that we stick to the concept here and not just branch off in every imaginable direction so if a listener had a an idea or an improvement or something, how would you recommend they reach out? Generally, the best way to discuss anything is on the mailing lists. We're an old open source project. We use mailing lists. So that's the best way to discuss ideas if you're just having an idea. If maybe you have an embryo or a start of some code, actually you started to do something, a change or, or reading a concept, written a concept, then maybe you could submit a pull request and here's my first shot. Take a look at this. Would this be acceptable to you? And then work with us maybe within that pull request. This uh, is a good base. Maybe you should do it like this instead. Maybe this contradicts what we're doing here. We should re- you know, remodel and do it like that and so on. And just be prepared to work with us and do a little bit of back and forth and then go forward. Usually, I also try to make sure that if you really want to see something happen, Make sure that you also stick around for the follow-up discussion because don't just throw code at us and go away and come back in two weeks because if you do, you'll find those questions or follow-up questions that were filed 30 minutes after your pull request was made and then it's been dead silent for two weeks. So if you really want to make something happen, be there and make sure that you follow code style and you make sure that everything works you have test cases you have you document the new features and stuff like that and just make sure that everything is in shape then you have i would say it isn't hard to do anything to do changes in curl as long as you just do things correctly and you have some patience and stick around thank you well, that brings us into the last section of the show a strange one but if you were starting curl again today would you <laughs> We did do it all the same or, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing and we should maybe indulge at some point in our lives. Yeah, I would imagine that if I hadn't started it, I'd, I, it feels like something I wouldn't start now. But if I hadn't done curl or lib curl, someone else would have done it. And then there would exist something else that would be similar to curl. I mean, as you described me from the beginning, I like internet transfer, internet protocols. That's sort of, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. I'm fascinated. I think that's fun. And I, 
I mean, I participate in a few different open source projects and I do some other things. And I, so a, apart from curl, for example, the biggest ones I think that I maintain as well is lib SSH2 and C ARIS projects. They do SSH and DNS stuff. So that's sort of the area I'm interested in internet protocols, internet transfers. So if I hadn't done curl, if I didn't work so much on curl today, I would probably sort of still be nosing around and digging around in network related libraries, network related code. So maybe not curl specifically, but I would have done something internet ish at least. What advice can you give after your hard earned experience for other open source project founders or those that wish to help with a project like curl? Well, for other maintainers, I don't know. I don't want to say that others should do what I've done or I don't think I've done anything magically strange or, or, or wonderful in the curl project. I try to lead by example. I try to listen in what other people say. I try to make sure that others can do as much as possible so that I don't have to do things. Make sure that we can widen the number of developers and everyone can do things individually and independently so that we don't introduce unnecessary bottlenecks in the project. I'm not sure I've succeeded in that very good, but that's what I'm trying to do. We're open for discussions and ideas and suggestions and stuff like that. But I think all of this is just how to how any open source maintainer would think and and consider open source working in open source is a lot of working with people. So of course, yeah, you just have to realize that there's a lot of different people and you need to understand that people are different. There are many different cultures. You have to have a thick skin and, and manage people somehow. That's really hard. And usually when I try to give advice to anyone who wants to participate in the project or, you know, join in and and do something here with us, I try to get people to work with something that you think is fun or or that concerns you. Maybe you have an itch that's to scratch. Maybe you have a use case you, you haven't found fulfilled or or you found a typo you want to fix or something that actually concerns you because it's much more fun to work on something that affects you personally so maybe that little feature you're missing or that little thing that doesn't work the way you want it get to that and fix that work on that and that doesn't only matter i mean that's only not a curl recommendation that's whatever you want to do in open source it's much better if you start with something that is near to your heart. Otherwise, I'm not a guy to give advice. I feel more like a lottery winner. So do you have any advice on what lottery numbers to pick? No, I, I don't. It was fortunate for me. I'm not sure I'm the one to tell anyone how to repeat it. Well, I think we'll accept that, but I feel you're downplaying your role dramatically. Well, yeah, maybe, but it's really hard for me to say what, what works for me and what, what doesn't work for me. I'm trying to run and be in the project the way I would have appreciated someone else to do it if I was a participant in the project, sort of. Yeah, that comes across. I mean, your person that applies to emails and things and how you can conduct stuff is a really good example. So what are some of the things that most users don't know about maintaining like a a project like Carl? We've talked about the support requests you get in, but is there anything else that goes on behind the scenes that is not normal for an open source project. If you're an open source maintainer for a, I, I say smaller project, because I think Curl is still a smaller project. It might be well used and popular and known, but it's still a smaller project in that I'm the only one working on it full time. Uh, so I think what a lot of people, may, not if you're an open source maintainer, I'm the only one working on it full time. Uh, so I think what a lot of people Not if you're an open source maintainer, you know this, but people from the outside, you know, if people who are working with other things don't realize how much other things than working on code you have to do when you're maintaining a project, you know, maintaining the servers, maintaining the mailing list, doing releases, setting up your scripts to update things, to do the CI jobs, the everything else around the project that needs to be maintained for it to run smoothly. I think a lot of people are sort of missing that huge amount of work that you have to keep up in a project to just keep everything 
afloat and, and going forward smoothly. So I think sometimes I spend a lot of time on stuff like that, you know, just polishing things around the project to make sure that it goes forward well. But that work isn't visible at all because when everything works, you know, you don't see what work that went on to make sure that nothing broke. The other day, for example, in a weak moment, I upgraded a little detail in my server and the server that runs all the mailing lists. And in that little moment of bad decisions, I accidentally upgraded my Python installation on the server to no longer feature Python 2. And then in one blow, I just broke a lot of server infrastructure. So the mailing lists, and I run a lot of mailing lists, they all broke in one moment. sort of. And then I had to spend several days restoring a Python 2 installation so that the mailing list could work again. And of course, from the outside, it wasn't really okay. The breakage was possibly visible for a select few who tried to use the emailing the mail list. I, I did actually see that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still, you know, a lot of work just to bring up everything back to look exactly like it did before. And for me, I bet I spent 12 hours on that or maybe more. And it was a really annoying and tough time here. But yeah, you know, from the outside, I didn't do anything on curl. Everything was just looking the same way as it did before. It wasn't on a Friday evening after a glass of wine, was it? I, I think it was actually worse. But it wasn't Friday evening, but it was still, you know, I, it was one of those decisions I did without even considering. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oops, this was not good. <laughs> then I had to suffer through it. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good example. Right, I'm going to close off a section and then start wrapping up. But I know one of the statistics that you like to talk about is the number of command line arguments that you can do. I think it's 750 or something. What are some of the weird, bizarre, unknown ones that you would like to let somebody know about? I actually added the 245th the other day. Oh, wow. So we're at 245. And the most recent one is... The, but it's not in any release yet, but it's dash dash JSON. Yeah, there's been a bit of noise about that one, hasn't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There's been a bit uh, positive and negatives about it, but this is a very simple one. I've added it to make it simpler for people to send and receive JSON. And I think a lot of people have been pretty positive about it. So it, that, that'll be fun. Now, I think some of my favorite ones that might not be that well used always, one, one of my absolute favorite ones is the dash dash lib curl, which is a command line option that converts the command line to a lib curl code or generates a template code in C for the command line you wrote. Basically, if you write a command line using curl, you do some kind of transfer, upload, download, whatever. And then you think, ah, I want to convert this into an application instead that uses lib curl. You run the same command line and you do dash dash lib curl example.c and then it'll generate that example.c for you with a skeleton code that uses libcurl to do that exact same i really wish i knew about that one <laughs> i just did that the other day i think i was on the mail list but i'll do that and check things out yeah i think it's really cool it's not complete of course because it, it, it's hard to <laughs> convert all of that into c code exactly but you get a pretty good start to base your further work on whatever you want to do when you want to do an, a libcurl application. And what is good is that most bindings for libcurl are, are actually rather thin. So most bindings for libcurl have the same options and stuff like that. So you can usually fairly easily even convert that C code into, for example, PHP code or Python code or other bindings that are because they usually look fairly similar to libcurl itself. That's one of my favorites. Another one that I like to point out to people is the dash dash resolve function, which is a way to pretty much populate the DNS cache from the command line. So you can add an IP address for a host name on the command line, <laughs> which is a way, basically, what, what you want to do is if you, for example, if you type curl example.com, but you decided to host that example.com on your local machine, for example, on localhost. And then you get a, you know, you get a problems with the name because the certificate maybe won't match and stuff like that. So then you have an option for curl that you can say that 
in this invocation, example.com is going to use this particular IP address instead. That's brilliant because that's normally something difficult to do when you're running CI jobs or editing, etc., hosts and everything like that. Exactly. Or when you're experimenting or you want to send in a particular name on that particular IP address and stuff like that. So th- was that's that, that was Resolver. Resolve. So, resolve. Yeah. I'm writing that down. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. Obviously, Curl is a very powerful tool with a strong history and global deployment base. But if there was one thing that a software engineer should remember from our show, what would you like it to be? I usually maintain that one of the primary qualities that made Curl or has made Curl and LibCurl succeed is just persistence to just keep on working on it until it actually works and until it actually succeeds. I often get to hear from people who try out things to, you know, write the tool and, and they say that, well, nobody's using it, it doesn't work, or nobody is succeeding. And I, I usually then try to go back and see that. It took me many, many, many years with Curl and LibCurl until we had a number of users. So I think if the one particular criteria to actually succeed with something like this is to just give it enough time and effort. So if you just want to and just keep on working on it, you can succeed in the long run. It's not necessarily an immediate hit just because it's a good idea. You just sometimes have to keep at it. And was there anything we missed that you'd like to talk about or mention? I could mention that we just recently surpassed 1,000 commit authors in the project. So we have more than 1,000 people who have actually written code merged into the project. Sometimes people think of me as, sort of, yeah, I'm the lead developer, but we're also a huge amount of people who actually contributed code to it. And what are their names? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the thanks list in Git, and that the thanks also includes all contributors. Who are, that's also people who have reported bugs and helped out in other ways. And that's, I think that's approaching 2,600 names now. So quite a lot of people who are helping out all the time. That's brilliant. Where can people find out more or get in touch? Everything Curl is, of course, on curl.se. If you want to read up on Curl, we have this book on everything.curl.dev, which is my book efforts to document Curl. And everything about me is, is on daniel.hacks.se. And I, of course, I'm on Twitter as Bagder, and I, I tweet a lot of Curl stuff nonstop, a lot of blabbing. Daniel, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure. This is Gavin Henry for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.